Archaeology is the business of finding old stuff in sand, and as such, practitioners are perpetually rooting around on their hands and knees for the next big discovery. But so obsessed are we with tantalising lost places like Atlantis, Nova Scotia's Money Pit, and the lost city of Z, Z, that sometimes we undervalue the outright majesty of the stuff that's already been found. This is understandable. When the holy grail of your profession is literally the holy grail, then there's always something to work towards. But in the name of giving credit where it's due, let's don our best fedoras, deck ourselves out in the most resplendent khaki, and apply the tiniest of brushes to the greatest archaeological discoveries ever made. Machu Picchu. In the early 20th century, a small cabal of Western adventurers were busy charting the Peruvian countryside for lost Inca cities. If they were honest, most of them were really hunting for the golden treasure rumoured to be hidden amongst the ruins. But that wasn't true of the American academic and explorer Hiram Bingham III, a history professor today sometimes called the real Indiana Jones. He wasn't an archaeologist, but he loved adventure and was enthralled by the quest to rediscover the last capitals of the Inca Empire, Vitcos and Vilcabamba. Both places had been swallowed up by Spanish conquistadors in the mid-16th century, before essentially disappearing from the world's gaze. In the summer of 1911, using native guides and local knowledge, as well as old Spanish chronicles and maps, Hiram Bingham put himself in what he thought was approximately the right part of Peru and just started looking. This simple strategy led to what some academics say was the greatest month of exploration ever. With his team, Bingham crossed the Urubamba River, navigated cliffs, valleys and dense jungle, climbed a mountainside and, at length, was met with what must have been an awe-inspiring sight. There, perched atop an 8,000-foot ridge, was what appeared to be a huge city ruin, with crumbling walls and stone structures built into the landscape. It was, he wrote, a great flight of beautifully constructed stone terraces, perhaps a hundred of them, each hundreds of feet long and ten feet high. Suddenly, I found myself confronted with the walls of ruined houses, built of the finest quality Inca stonework. We're used to Machu Picchu looking nice and tidy, but in Bingham's day it was broken, scattered and messy, having been unloved for the best part of 400 years. The modern Machu Picchu has had a lot of touch-up work, which continues to this day. Bingham, not content with this once-in-a-generation discovery, ploughed on over the Andes mountain range. He very quickly discovered Vitcos about 30 miles to the west. Then with some additional intel from new informants, he continued trekking in the direction of the Amazon and found Vilcabamba, now named Espiritu Pampa, taking his tally of lost cities from naught to three in a single expedition. Machu Picchu itself was never a capital. Scholars believe it was either a royal estate for Inca nobles or some kind of religious site, with a population of only around 750 people, probably because it's such a bugger to get to. But its location is what makes it so extraordinary, along with its dramatic surroundings, altitude, and of course its status as having been lost. Which brings us to an important point about the nature of the word discovery, which in this context really just means shown to Westerners. If you look closely at one of Bingham's photos documenting the discovery, you'll see a charcoal tag scrawled on a stone, dated 1902, nine years before Bingham even rocked up. It was written by Augustine Lizarraga, a Peruvian farmer who was with a group looking for land fit for cultivation when he stumbled across the ruins. Correctly identifying his find as valuable, he wrote his name on it, but without a camera or contacts at the National Geographic Society, word of his discovery failed to go viral. Lizarraga's diminishment was sealed when Bingham ordered that his tag be washed off, for reasons of preservation, you understand. To this day, Lizarraga's role in bringing Machu Picchu to the light still isn't properly recognised. His Wikipedia page is a mere fraction of Bingham's, despite Bingham essentially playing Aldrin to his Armstrong. Nor, it has to be said, has the contribution of scores of nameless local villagers, informants and guides. These are the people who essentially pointed out the citadel remnants so Bingham could take pictures of them. For these folks, Machu Picchu must have just been the ruins up the hill, unsavvy to the stir news about them would cause across the US and Europe. But without them, you have to think that Bingham would have been stuck chasing his tail. Whether any of this is fair or not is, as always, in the eye of the viewer. But what's clear is that it wasn't until Bingham pointed his camera at Machu Picchu that the world recognised its wonder and endowed it with the legendary status it has today. Qin Shi Huang's City for the Afterlife for thousands of years, what was designed to be Qin Shi Huang's heavenly brigade, the Terracotta Army, lay underground and undiscovered. It's fair to say that China's first emperor, who died about 2,200 years ago, had a pretty high opinion of himself. 
and as such commissioned the build of a vast burial complex for his expired remains to call home. In its entirety, the mighty necropolis covers perhaps 100 square kilometres and features a central pyramid-shaped burial chamber, hermetically sealed, of about 100 by 75 metres. This is surrounded by a system of walls and gateways, offices, halls, thousands of different statues, other graves, stables, and various mystery rooms. Most of the roughly 200 pits peppering the colossal mausoleum remain unexcavated. What we know about them comes from inferences based on what has been recovered so far, plus ground-penetrating radar readings and sampling. But on its own, the Terracotta Army is a funereal installation rivaling the final resting place of any pharaoh for scope and grandeur, making its discovery one of the most profound in the history of archaeology. Surprisingly, given its scale, no one knew about it until 1974, when a group of farmers started digging a well about a mile from the location of Qin's tomb in Lingtong County, Shanxi province. As they progressed down, clay fragments were unearthed, including bricks and tiles, but also pieces of what were obviously statues. When the farmers started selling these pieces in local markets and to local authorities, archaeologists cottoned on, and an investigation began. What they unearthed was the most spectacular figurine group ever discovered, as well as one of the most traumatic archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. On its own, Pit 1 contains the bulk of an army of more than 6,000 soldiers, some 2,000 of which have been reassembled. Each is around six feet tall, and they stand three or four abreast in lines of trenches. Beneath their feet are paved tracks, and originally they were covered with a wooden ceiling supported by beams, plus a damp proofing of reed mats covered with clay. All in all, maybe 8,000 soldiers in total. Elsewhere, the surprises continue, with carriages in bronze, figurines of strong men, acrobats, concubines, musicians, and officials. All the entertainment a man might need in the afterlife. But perhaps most bizarre of all, the complex features an underground park, complete with bronze cranes and ducks. There are so many astounding aspects of the terracotta warriors that it's hard to list them all in one place. Each figure is unique, with individual facial features, body positions and poses. They were built from the ground up using coils of clay, the heads made separately and stuck on afterwards. Clothes and facial features were added before each figure was fired in a kiln. Then they were individually painted, staged in position, and real weapons placed in their hands. Around 40,000 swords, spears, and shields were buried with the army, having never been used on the battlefield. Needless to say, a work of this magnitude required some serious labour. According to Han Dynasty historian Sima Qian, thousands of slaves worked on Qin's tomb alone, and by the sounds of things, did a pretty splendid job. Unlike the Terracotta army, the tomb was never lost, but also unlike the Terracotta army, it hasn't been excavated, a tantalising fact given Sima Qian's description of it. Palaces and scenic towers for a hundred officials were constructed, and the tomb was filled with rare artefacts and wonderful treasure. Craftsmen were ordered to make crossbows and arrows, primed to shoot at anyone who enters the tomb. Mercury was used to simulate the hundred rivers, the Yangtze, Yellow River, and the Great Sea, and set to flow mechanically. Above were the representations of the heavenly constellations, below the features of the land. With his astronomical ego, obsession with his own immortality, and liberal use of slave labour, it's fair to say Emperor Qin was a bit of a tool. But maybe the worst event associated with him took place after he died. When the burial was complete, it was considered too risky to leave the artisans and craftsmen who worked on the tomb's mechanical devices free to divulge its secrets. So the completely reasonable decision was taken to bury them all alive. And presumably just for the sake of balance, all the emperor's childless concubines were thrown in for good measure. According to Sima Qian, After the funeral ceremonies had completed, and the treasures hidden away, the inner passageway was blocked and the outer gate lowered, immediately trapping everyone inside. Odd to think that a civilization of such sophistication could be at the same time so unfathomably callous. Either way, the Terracotta Army is one of humanity's greatest accomplishments, and even to this day remains an archaeological gift that just keeps on giving. Petra Like Machu Picchu, it's debatable whether Petra, in modern-day Jordan, even counts as a lost city. At nearly 150 feet tall and 160 wide, on its own the ancient metropolis's monastery is pretty hard to miss. And although this is one of its biggest buildings, Petra has an awful lot more to offer besides. There's a theatre, garden and pool complex, castle, church, royal tombs, the intriguingly named Street of Facades, and al Kazne, or The Treasury, which appears in the third, and final, Indiana Jones film. The site has been occupied for several thousand years, and at its peak was home to around 20,000 people. Its iconic faciers, columns and statues were not constructed, but carved meticulously from the giant limestone rocks that cover the area. And it's not just a pretty face either. 
The Rose City once boasted an advanced water system of conduits and dams that enabled the harvesting and distribution of water year-round. By overcoming the desert conditions, Petra became a regional trading centre connecting Asia's Silk Road to the spice routes of southern Europe. The bulk of the work to create the Petra we know today happened in the 1st century CE, when an ancient Bedouin tribe called the Nabataeans chiselled the architectural masterpieces over several generations. But no sooner had they got it looking just right than the Greeks attacked. Then in 106 CE, the Romans invaded and took control of the city, hanging around until a 4th century earthquake partially destroyed it. The Byzantines took over for around 300 years, during which time Petra saw a decline in its commercial, political and cultural relevance. It was abandoned in the 8th century and for more than a thousand years served as little more than temporary shelter for the odd passing shepherd. Cue the arrival in 1812 of Johann Ludwig Burckhardt, an explorer whose preparation for his discovery must rank among the most comprehensive in the history of journeying. A native of Switzerland, Burckhardt reduced the risk of his exploration in Arabia by learning and adopting local language, habits and costume. To that end, he studied Arabic at Cambridge University, then travelled to Aleppo in Syria, spending two years absorbing and embracing Islamic customs. He adopted the alias Sheikh Ibrahim ibn Abdallah, before embarking on three trial journeys to Lebanon, Palestine and Transjordan. He then headed for Cairo, on the way hearing of an ancient city ruin nestled in a narrow valley in a province known to him by its Roman name of Arabia Petraea. Explaining to his guide that he wished to sacrifice a goat at the nearby biblical tomb of Aaron, brother of Moses, he was led through the valley and on the 22nd of August 1812 became the first European in a thousand years to lay his eyes on Petra. Like in the case of Hiram Bingham standing before Machu Picchu, it was an overwhelming experience, which Burkhardt wrote about breathlessly in his journal. An excavated mausoleum came into view, the situation and beauty of which are calculated to make an extraordinary impression upon the traveller, after having traversed for nearly half an hour such a gloomy and almost subterraneous passage. The natives call this monument Kazir Farun, or Pharaoh's Castle, and pretend it was the residence of a prince. But it was rather the sepulchre of a prince, and great must have been the opulence of the city which could dedicate such monuments to the memory of its rulers. Burkhardt didn't dwell long in Petra, fearing being unmasked as a treasure-hunting infidel, and travelled to Cairo, trekking part of the Nile River before being turned around by hostile locals. It was on his way back north in March 1813 that he stumbled across the ruins of the great temple of Ramesses II at Abu Simbel. Sadly for Burkhardt, he was unable to get inside, the entrance being blocked by colossal sand dunes blown in over the centuries. Instead, he messaged his friend and fellow adventurer Giovanni Belzoni, who excavated the temple in 1817 by essentially digging it out of the desert. This temple, built to commemorate Ramsay's leadership in the Battle of Kadesh in the 13th century, was another staggering discovery. What Burkhardt missed out on was an interior replete with huge engravings and reliefs showing Ramesses' victory over the Hittites. Even sadder for Burkhardt was that he didn't live long enough to achieve his intended aim of seeing the Niger River or Timbuktu. Although he did manage to become one of only a handful of Europeans to make the pilgrimage to Mecca and perform Hajj rituals. When he died of dysentery just five years later at the age of 32, he was buried a Muslim with a tombstone bearing the name Sheikh Ibrahim. Pompeii. Unlike some cities on the list, Pompeii has a genuine claim to the title lost, given that for nearly 1500 years it lay under a thick blanket of hardened ash, ejected from its near neighbour and volcano, Mount Vesuvius. After the eruption that engulfed the city in 79 CE, Pompeii is thought to have received visitors, at least initially, including thieves and disaster tourists, but also its own former inhabitants. Most of them survived the eruption of Vesuvius, forewarned by ground tremors and having the good sense to leave before the inevitable happened. But returning, they would have been disappointed. Pompeii was mostly buried under tons of ash and pumice that washed over it in a tsunami-like pyroclastic flow. Over the following centuries, with more eruptions from Vesuvius which completely consumed Pompeii, the city, once home to maybe 20,000 people, was simply forgotten. Its rediscovery was as gradual as its concealment, beginning in 1592 when an architect named Domenico Fontana uncovered walls with paintings and inscriptions. He was digging a tunnel for an aqueduct connecting water to nearby mills, the hole for which passed straight through the underground ruin. But he kept his find a secret, perhaps fearing loss of work, and Pompeii slumbered for another century. That was until a man named Giuseppe Macrini received a tip-off about an inscription that had been uncovered, and in 1693 he began a partial excavation. He found some walls and translated an inscription that read Town Councillor of Pompeii, becoming the first person in a millennia and a half to realise that the city bearing this name lay in ruins beneath his feet. 
Then, in 1738, the nearby town of Herculaneum was found by workers digging foundations for the palace of Charles of Bourbon, the then King of Naples. This triggered the first concerted effort to exhume large sections of Pompeii by a man called Roque Hakim de Alquiber, and in August 1763, a new inscription confirmed that what they were looking at really was Pompeii. Ever since, generations of archaeologists have taken on the bewildering programme of work to unearth the lost city and preserve what they find. The treasures include a Greek temple dating back to the 6th century BCE, places of worship dedicated to the gods Apollo and Jupiter, gladiator barracks, all manner of paintings, frescoes, potteries and tools, plus of course a couple of amphitheatres, and new unearthings continue to this day. In 2018, the remains of harnessed horses were found in a suburban Roman house called the Villa of Mysteries, located on the outskirts of the city. In 2020, a thermopolonium, or food shop, was excavated, while the following year the decorated tomb of Marcus Venerius Secundio, a Roman impresario and former slave, was discovered. Which brings us neatly to perhaps Pompeii's most famous feature, the calcified relics of the citizens themselves. Estimates suggest that roughly 2,000 people ignored the warning signs on that fateful day in 79, opting to stay in Pompeii, thereby sealing their fate. They died within just a few minutes of Vesuvius' eruption, not killed by molten lava, but a lethal gas cloud which spewed forth from the volcano. According to experts, not only was this boiling hot, but it was also a lethal cocktail of carbon dioxide, chlorides and volcanic glass. So the residents died of asphyxiation, only to be fossilised in place by the scalding hot debris that rained down soon afterwards. Well, sort of. The famous bodies associated with Pompeii were not preserved by the pyroclastic flow. Rather, the material that engulfed them set solid, leaving a void as the bodies of the victims decayed. The figures are in fact all casts, made when the archaeologist Giuseppe Fiorelli devised a technique of filling the spaces with plaster of Paris to recreate each person's final moment on Earth. So they're not technically bodies, but eerily a skeleton remains in place within each cast. The excavation at Pompeii has not always run smoothly. Exposed to the elements for the first time in such a long time, anything that is not meticulously preserved is already degrading. In 2010, the roof of the House of Gladiators collapsed under heavy rainfall. Erosion caused by the weight of tourism, rain, sunlight and wind damage, even creeping vegetation, are all taking their toll. Meaning vulnerable parts of Pompeii, such as the original murals and paintings, are literally disappearing. But such is the staggering trove of treasures on offer, that even a depleted Pompeii is a modern wonder of the world, and a bucket list entry for any adventurer worthy of the name. Mohenjo Daro Mohenjo-daro, literally meaning Mound of the Dead, was the largest settlement of the Indus Valley Civilization. Founded four and a half thousand years ago in Sindh, modern-day Pakistan, it was one of the world's first major cities, contemporaneous with ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. It was also the most advanced city of its day, with sophisticated urban planning and engineering going into the conurbation's design and build, supporting its comparatively enormous population of at least 40,000 people. But Mohenjo-daro was abandoned after only about six centuries, along with other cities in the region, owing to a sudden and rapid decline in the Indus population, after which it remained undocumented for more than 3,700 years, and rediscovered by R.D. Banerjee, an officer with the Archaeological Survey of India. He visited the site around 1920 and spotted its stupa, a mound built to house relics like the remains of monks or nuns. It led to excavations headed by the tragically named Cayenne Dickshit and British archaeologist John Marshall, revealing a huge city with public buildings, facilities and water conduits, all mapped with a high degree of planning and organisation. But perhaps the most striking aspect of this 100 hectare site is the fact that it isn't very striking. Despite the obvious success and wealth of Mohenjo-daro, the grandiose palaces, monuments and temples so often associated with lost cities are missing. Instead, there is row upon row of neatly organised buildings and thoroughfares. It seems its residents preferred order, efficiency and practicality over hubristic displays of power and prosperity. In 1980, it became the first site in South Asia to be granted UNESCO World Heritage status, but like Pompeii, is threatened by erosion and questionable restoration. Gobekli Tepe Predating Stonehenge by 6,000 years, Turkey's Gobekli Tepe is the world's oldest surviving temple complex. Rediscovered by German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt just over 25 years ago, the structure sits on a limestone plateau near the city of Urfa, close to Turkey's border with Syria. Gobekli Tepe, meaning Belly Hill, is composed of 20 circular enclosures made of stone, while at its centre are two 5-metre pillars carved into vaguely human shapes. Other smaller statues are complete with discernible faces, hands, and, it goes without saying, erections. 
The theory goes that the temple was constructed out of chunks of limestone by bands of nomadic tribespeople who, motivated by a shared belief system, came together periodically for building sprints and epic feasts before dispersing again. What's truly remarkable about this is that the carvings are estimated to be at least 11,000 years old, from a time before humans had figured out how to domesticate animals or even make pottery. This cathedral on a hill, as Schmidt called it, literally changed our understanding of history. Before its discovery, archaeologists believed that humans needed to create food surpluses through farming before they could devote time to large-scale rituals. Gobekli Tepe seems to have proved them wrong. It is Earth's first evidence of collaborative work on a project of significance, and it was accomplished by people who lived off the land using the same methods as their ancestors hundreds of thousands of years before. This was a time when the fertile crescent of land around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers was a natural paradise full of wildlife not the dust bowl it became due to intensive agriculture and settlement. This extraordinary discovery blesses researchers with unique insights into the birth of organised religion, as well as the inflection point between a world of Neolithic hunter-gatherers and one cultivated by farmers. In other words, it joins the dots between the early and modern versions of humanity. Hi guys, how's it going? I hope you enjoyed watching that video. I wanted to do this video because although I and most of you have heard of many of these places, I was interested in the context behind them and the people who discovered them and the nature of discovery, how they came into being, what they were for, who lived in them and why. Originally I was going to do a long list of archaeological sites, including places like Troy and Sutton Hoo and Tutankhamun's um, burial place and the rest of it, but the video would have been about seven hours long so I decided not to do that. So normal stuff, uh, give us a like, do subscribe if you haven't already. I know a lot of people watch videos without subscribing and that's fair enough, but if you if you want to do it, the button's right there. Please do share, um, tell a friend or loved one. If you have any suggestions, um, write them in the comments. You can email me. Um, I do read the comments. I do read my emails. Um, shout out to Jeff in Oregon, I think it is, who emailed me the other week. Um, <laughs> it's all good stuff. So let's continue that. I hope you enjoyed it. And most importantly, Thank you for watching.